Hello everyone. Thank you for coming to what is the first of this year's Birds Meet webinars. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Annie and I'm the coordinator of the Urban Birds Program at BirdLife Australia. I know we're normally joined by Holly, who's on some much needed leave at the moment, which is nice. Um, so I'm coming to you from the Wurundjeri lands of the Kulin Nation, so down in Melbourne. Uh, and it's been one of those really kind of crisp, beautiful days here, although I did spend most of it at a desk inside. Um, so tonight we're doing something that is maybe a little bit left of centre for a birds in backyards crowd, because we're actually going to be talking about what happens when birds meet Antarctica. So tonight we're joined by Dr Murray Hilton. Um, I first met Murray when we were both studying for our PhDs and she used hers to help conservationists understand how they could better manage threatened species. And since then, she's gone on to have an incredible experience um, living and working in Antarctica, which we're all here to learn about tonight. So in a second, I'll pass it over to Murray, but just a little bit of housekeeping. So you're free to pop questions in the chat as they arise to you. Um, and what will happen at the end is I'll just speak to all the questions and we'll just do a little bit of a conversation uh, back and forth. So hopefully everyone can have uh, anything they ask answered at the end. Um, if you're having any tech difficulties, you can also pop them in the chat and I will do my best to help, although I'm not making any promises. And we are recording this session, so it's going to be popped up on YouTube, on our YouTube channel, BBTV, probably after Easter for anyone who wants to rewatch, who couldn't get enough. All right, so now I'll just hand over. So please take it away. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, Annie, very much for the introduction. Um, as Annie said, my name is Mary. Uh, I am uh, going to be talking to you today uh, about my experiences in Antarctica. Uh, it's going to be very penguin focused. Um, can you, Annie, you can hear me okay? Yes, perfect. Yes, perfect. Good. Um, yep, so I, uh, I'm originally from Scotland. I did do my PhD in Australia, which is um, where I was very lucky to meet Annie. Um, but I do live over in New Zealand now. <laughs> Um, so I'll just give you, oops, let me just get teams over here. Um, I'll just give you really quickly a bit of background about myself before I get into the interesting bit. Um, so I have always, since I can remember, always been very obsessed with Antarctica and the idea of getting to Antarctica. However, when I was growing up, uh, it didn't for some reason seem possible. Um, so I started out my career in conservation biology uh, in much warmer, more tropical climes. Um, so I went to Glasgow, went to Glasgow Uni to do my undergrad. Um, and when I was there, I joined the Glasgow Uni Exploration Society. Um, and that was sort of a club that organised um, fieldwork trips for um, undergrads to go and get some skills in conservation research, basically. Um, so I got to go over to Tobago, first of all. Um, and did some sea turtle research and research into amphibians. Um, and I also got to go to Peru um, and spent a few months in the Amazon um, looking at all sorts of different biodiversity um, and how biodiversity had been impacted um, by forestry, logging operations. Um, so we were looking at insects, we were looking at mammals, um, and we did spend quite a bit of time um, researching birds when we were there as well. Um, and then a couple of years after that, I actually came over to Australia for the first time um, to help out um, a friend from home who was doing his PhD at Deakin Uni. Um, and he was working with Zoos Victoria and so they're looking in the uh, the impact of chytrid fungus on bob off frogs sort of up in the um, Victorian Alps. So that was my first introduction to Australia there and um, doing some field work. Oops, there we go. Um, I then did my, uh, my master's, um, so I went back to Glasgow Uni um, and I worked with the RSPB, so this was my first sort of um, foray into being an ornithologist. Um, so I worked with the RSPB um, on a project studying a species of grouse uh, called a capricale, um, and we were looking at the impacts of climate change and land use change on uh, the impact of that on capricale populations across Scotland. Um, and so what we were doing was working with the Forestry Commission to try and work out how they could change their forestry operations in terms of um, what areas of Scotland should they um, focus on planting forestry in, where should they um, sort of revegetate to try and account for um, climate change and how that was going to impact Capricale into the future. 
Um, and the thing I really liked about that project was the applied nature of it. So getting to work with some conservation organisations um, to try and really make a difference on the ground. And so that, uh, that sort of influenced the PhD project that I went on to apply for. Um, so I finished up my PhD at Monash Uni a couple of years ago. Um, and so, as Annie mentioned, uh, I was working on uh, threatened species conservation. So I worked with the Department of Conservation in New Zealand and the Saving Our Species programme up in New South Wales. And I got to meet a lot of really, really interesting um, conservation practitioners um, and we worked with them to come up with ways that they could try and sort of streamline the way that they were making the decisions um, to how they streamline the decisions for how they would manage their threatened species and um, to try and make it more proactive to improve conservation outcomes. Um, so it was quite a broad project. It was quite general um, and we worked across all sorts of different species. Um, we looked at things like marine mammals. Um, we looked at amphibians, plants, insects. Um, but we did also look at some really interesting species of birds. Um, so I worked with the Chatham Island uh, petrel, the uh, khaki or black stilt, uh, the regent honey eater and the ground parrot. So it was a really great project for um, building a good sort of baseline of knowledge across a lot of different species um, across a few countries as well. So it was really great. Um, however, when I was coming to the end of my PhD, I'd started to really miss getting out in the field um, and I was chatting with my partner and sort of confessed that I'd had this uh, sort of long desire to get to Antarctica and I thought that now was the time coming to the end of my PhD, I was starting to look for a job, um, I thought that I would uh, try and yeah, <laughs> apply for a few jobs and see what happened um, and I actually got really lucky that the first job that I did apply for to get to Antarctica that I got. So. That was the beginning uh, of the last two years. Um, yeah, it's beginning of really, yeah, really wonderful chance that I've been really lucky to get down to Antarctica um, and yeah, sort of become a little bit obsessed with it since then. Um, so the area of Antarctica where I spent my time was up on the peninsula there. Um, so that's sort of, if you just head straight down from South America, from Argentina and Chile, um, that gets you down to the Antarctic Peninsula. Um, it's a really incredible place. Um, it's very quickly become one of my favourite places in the world. Um, and so I'll just give you a little bit of a background on Antarctica um, in general before we dive into uh, the penguins and the birds. Um, so Antarctica is uh, it's a really hostile sort of environment and it's a continent full of superlatives. So it is the coldest continent on Earth. The coldest temperature they've recorded is minus 89 degrees Celsius. It's the windiest continent on Earth. Um, so they've recorded wind speeds up to 326 kilometres an hour. Uh, that's the maximum wind speed. Um, it's also the driest continent on Earth. So when you get up onto the polar plateau, um, it has an average of about 20 millimetres a year of precipitation. Um, and that's comparable to um, the precipitation that a lot of the world's hot deserts get as well. So a very dry place. Um, it also on average is the highest continent. Um, the average elevation is about two and a half thousand metres. Um, and in comparison, the average elevation in Australia is just over 300 metres. So um, yeah, very high continent. Um, it also is deceptively big. Um, it's around twice the size of Australia. So it's this really, really big land mass. Um, and on of this big land mass, around 98% of it is covered in ice sheet uh, that averages about one, uh, one and a half kilometres thick. So yeah. Very big landmass, uh, yeah, country, a uh, continent that is um, very extreme, um, very hostile. Um, but it does have um, some really um, interesting sort of um, governance. So um, a few countries like Australia and New Zealand and the UK do claim their sort of territories of Antarctica. However, there isn't actually any government. Um, no country owns Antarctica in any way. Um, and it's been managed or sort of managed under the Antarctic Treaty since 1959. And so this was originally 12 countries that came together um, to sign the treaty. It's now increased up to 56. Um, and around 30 years ago, Antarctica was designated as a natural reserve devoted to peace and science. So there's no military operations down there. There's no mining. There's nothing like that. Um, so it's a really good example of um, international um, cooperation and, and what can happen when countries get together um, and sort of work towards a common good. So. Yeah, very hostile place, but also um, very interesting as well. So I've been very lucky to have two experiences down in Antarctica that have both been very, very different. So the first time I went down there, I was based um, at a historic British base. 
Um, and I spent five months down there living in this tiny little shack um, that you can see that's just peeking out the top of the snow there. Um, so I was down in a sort of very remote, isolated place. Um, the second time um, I went back, so I just got back um, around six or seven weeks ago now, um, I went down as a guest scientist on board uh, an expedition cruise ship. Um, so these are ships that take tourists from South America down to Antarctica. So um, I was sort of uh, in this sort of luxury experience as a guest scientist, um, yeah, traveling around uh, all across the Antarctic Peninsula. Um, so they were very different experiences, one very basic, one very remote, one a bit more luxurious uh, and traveling around the place. But the thing that they um, did have in common was that they were both very focused on penguins. Uh, and so that brings us, I guess, more towards the uh, the bird portion of the presentation. Um, so I'll just give you a little bit of a background on penguins. I'm sure you are all already quite familiar with them, um, but I'll just give you a bit of a run through anyway. So there are 18 species of penguins found across the world. Um, they're all found in the southern hemisphere. So, of course, down in Antarctica, um, up the coast of South America to the Galapagos, really near the equator. Um, across to South Africa um, and then as we know they're found in Australia and in New Zealand as well. Um, so yeah 18 different species found across the southern hemisphere. Uh, and so why should we study penguins other than the fact that they <clears throat> are very cute, they're very charismatic, they're great animals to work with um, but they are what we refer to as marine sentinels. So they occupy this really interesting place in the Antarctic food web which we've got pictured here um, and that they're both predator and prey. Um, and they're also very sensitive to changes in their environment. So if we um, study penguins and we see that their populations are changing, um, then we can use that to sort of infer um, how the ecosystem is doing generally down there in Antarctica. Um, and another thing that you'll notice as well is that most of the species that are found in this Antarctic um, ecosystem, they all spend all of their time underneath the water in the sea. Um, and that makes them really challenging to study, it makes it yeah, really, uh, really challenging, really costly. However, penguins do come up onto the land every year to nest. Um, and so that provides a really good opportunity for us to study their populations and see how they're getting on um, without having to try and sort of track them underneath the water. So. Yeah, they give us a good idea of how the ecosystem is doing and they're much easier to monitor than a lot of the other species. Um, so yeah, I'll just talk now uh, about my um, first experience that I had down in uh, Antarctica. So the first time I went down, I was at this um, research base um, or historic base um, called Port Lockroy. Um, and this is it just pictured here in front of these incredible mountains. Um, so Port Lockroy is managed by the UK Antarctic Heritage Trust. Um, it's one of um, six historic sites that they manage all across the um, Western Antarctic Peninsula. Um, and it has a really interesting history that I'll give you just a really quick run through. Um, so Port Lockroy was established during the Second World War um, during a secret wartime mission, which was codenamed Operation Tabarin. So Tabarin was actually a nightclub in Paris. Um, and the reason that Port Lockroy was established was because the British government at the time sort of felt that the Argentinian government of the time were taking a bit of advantage of the distraction of the war um, to move in and start make, making claims across the Antarctica and sort of claim that as their own. Um, and the British government were worried that they would lose any claims that they could make to the Antarctic continent. Um, and they were also worried about sort of some communications going on that might negatively impact the Allied forces during the war. So what they did was they sent down this team um, of men to establish the um, Port Lockroy base and they also established a few other bases there at the same time. Um, and they felt that by having this team of people down there permanently um, over winter that that would help them to establish the or sort of reinforce the British claim to Antarctica. So Port Lockroy actually became the first um, permanently occupied British base. Um, it was the first British base to have people there over the winter. So got a really interesting history there. Um, so it was managed that way for only for a few years during the war um, and then it went on to become a scientific research station. Um, so um, from sort of 1944-45 onwards um, it was just used purely by um, for science um, and so it was where the Falkland Island Dependency Survey was established so that was the predecessor to the British Antarctic Survey so they did lots of environmental research, lots of mapping, all that sort of thing um, and that's sort of how the base was managed for the next 20 or so years. 
Um, another sort of quirky thing about Port Lockroy, so some of you might be familiar with it, um, it gets called the Penguin Post Office. Um, and so all of the bases that were set up during Operation Tabarin, including Port Lockroy, um, they all had post offices set up. Um, and that was sort of another part of the British claim to the area. They felt that by having post offices that had stamps, um, stamps in a way are synonymous with currency, by having these men down there throughout the whole year and trading currency when they were down there, um, that that would help further, again, the British claim to Antarctica. So uh, it's a little bit quirky um, and the post office is still going today. So the base is operated as a historic site. People can come and visit the museum that's there, the historic base, um, and also send uh, a postcard from Antarctica. So that was quite quirky. Um, so the experience that we had at Port Lockroy was absolutely incredible, um, but it was quite basic. So there wasn't any running water there, and um, there also wasn't Wi-Fi. However, I think that we were the last season to not have Wi-Fi. I think they have Starlink now, so we just got through without it. We all really enjoyed uh, sort of being cut off from the world once we were away. Um, and the base was run on solar power um, almost entirely. All of the electricity came from solar power. Um, and we were a team of just four women um, that were there um, for around about um, four or five months. And we did have a few other people come and stay with us for um, various times throughout the season. Um, but we were only four people that were there um, through most of the time. Um, and this is something that might sound a bit strange for Antarctica, um, but our season was actually defined by unusual and very significant snowfall. So this is what the base looked like when we first arrived. Um, we did have a lot of penguins that were just sort of freely wandering around on the roof of all these buildings. Uh, I think at one point we had about 16 penguins up on the roof um, and one penguin even laid an egg up there. Um, so just sort of for context, normally when you would get there, there would not be too much snow left. Um, you get there in the summer season, so you wouldn't expect the bases to be completely covered in snow. Of course, there would be a little bit because it's Antarctica, but you wouldn't expect quite this volume normally. Um, and what that meant was that even though we had these uh, amazing solar pa panels that usually worked really well, um, they obviously don't work if they're buried underneath a metre of snow. Um, so we spent a really significant amount of our time there um, just out sort of clearing snow off of the solar panels to make sure that we could uh, keep the lights on. <laughs> Um, it also meant that we spent a lot of our time digging steps out of snow. Um, so the picture on the left with the steps there, um, that is the way that we got in and out of the house. Um, and by the end of the season, there wasn't actually any snow there at all. And you went down to get out of the building. So it was sort of a good few metres of snow um, that we had to contend with. And on the right hand side there, um, that was the way that we could get on and off the island and how visitors got on and off the island. Um, so we did have to spend quite a lot of time sort of digging those steps to maintain the access to the island. So we became very uh, familiar with our shovels throughout the season. <laughs> Um, and just to provide a little bit of context there, uh, this is the island where the base is. Um, so it's on Goodyear Island. Um, it's really tiny. It's got uh, the circumference of the island, only about 750 metres. Um, got a couple of humpback whales in the foreground there for sort of the, the size comparison. So um, it's a very tiny island, um, very remote, um, isolated sort of location. Um, with yeah, only a team of four there to run it. So it was a really, really incredible experience. Um, but as well as having all of this um, really interesting historic side of things, um, the island is also home to a population of around about 1,000 Gentoo penguins. Um, and the role that I had there was as the wildlife monitor to oversee the study of the population on the island. So a little bit of background about Gentoo penguins. Um, Gentoo penguins are one of three of the um, brush tail group of penguins. So that's the three up in the top right of the penguin diagram there. Uh, it's estimated that there's about 430,000 breeding pairs found across the world. Um, and this is where uh, the penguins are found, the gentoos are found. So there's a lot of them down on the Antarctic Peninsula. Um, there's some up in South America, Falkland Islands, South Georgia, and then round to some of the other um, sub-Antarctic islands around the other side. Um, of the 430,000, around 127,000 of those um, are found down on the Antarctic Peninsula. So it represents um, sort of just over a quarter of the population. 
Um, and something really interesting about genters, um, a lot of the time when we hear about um, charismatic species or just species in general, um, it's quite doom and gloom. However, with the Gen 2 population down in the peninsula, and they're actually increasing by about two and a half percent every year. So since uh, 2013, their population's increased by 23 uh, percent, so almost a quarter increase um, in just over 10 years. Um, they are a bit of a generalist with the things that they eat. So they eat a lot of krill, um, but they also eat some fish and squid um, and sort of the benefits of being a generalist feeder we will come back to a little bit later on. So the Gen 2 penguin study at Port Lockroy. Um, so we were looking into the uh, breeding population size and the breeding success of the population. It follows the protocol outlined by the Convention for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources, or CAMLAR, um, and this is basically a standardised approach that has been developed uh, and used since the 80s to monitor penguin populations in Antarctica. Um, it's used at about 30 different sites, um, which basically lets us look and see if we have a standardised way for monitoring the populations in different places. Um, we can sort of keep track of those populations, see how they're doing, and we know that any differences that we see in their population size aren't because of um, differences in the monitoring method used. So it's just a really good standardised way to keep track of populations across quite a few different sites. Um, so the pop um, penguin study at Port Lockroy has been happening um, since the 1996-97 Antarctic season, um, so almost 30 years of data collected there. Um, and as well as keeping track of the population size and breeding success, it uh, also has um, a control area um, to um, sort of monitor the impact of disturbance. So already on this teeny tiny island with a 750 metre circumference and around a third of the island is closed off to visitors. Um, so that also includes the team of people that are living and working at Port Lockroy. Um, we only went into that part of the island twice in the five months that we were there and both of those times was to study the penguins that were in that area. So yeah, keeping that area free from visitors helps us see whether if there's any changes in the subcolonies that are there versus the subcolonies in the visited area, we can sort of infer that um, those changes might be because of um, visitation or disturbance from the team. Um, so the way that we monitored the penguins at Port Lockroy, um, so there was around 10 subcolonies, and one of those is designated as the chronology colony. So what we did is we went up and we checked on this colony every two or three days. Um, we counted how many nests were in the colony, um, and we looked at the percentage of those nests that had eggs early on in the season. And then later on, we looked at the percentage of nests that had chicks. Um, so here's me out doing the penguin survey with my penguin PPE on. Um, so we had uh, had this boiler suit that I wore all the time that I referred to as my poo suit because um, you can see in the background there uh, the penguins do generate quite a significant amount of guano. Um, I also had thick boots uh, and thick gloves on um, as well as some ski goggles which you can see I'm wearing despite the fact that it isn't snowing. Um, and that's because the survey method sort of involves getting quite up close with the penguins and they are quite feisty. Uh, they're not afraid to give you a bit of a peck, a bite or a slap. So we had to make sure that we were keeping ourselves um, safe from the, these feisty little penguins. <clears throat> and so when you're checking on your chronology colony, once it gets up to a threshold of 95% of those nests having eggs and later on chicks, that initiates an island wide survey. So you go out and you count every single nest, uh, every single egg and every single chick later on um, across the entire island. Uh, and that, I think some people might imagine that surveying penguins in Antarctica might be a bit of a glamorous job. Um, but in actual fact, it did involve uh, crawling around underneath these buildings uh, through lots of penguin poo sometimes. So uh, these penguins were quite smart. Um, their predators are aerial. So if they nest underneath these buildings, it keeps them safe from their aerial predators. And um, it also keeps them safe from the Antarctic elements. So really smart from the penguins to um, hide out underneath these buildings to build their nests. Uh, less good for me to have to crawl around in penguin poop to look at penguin nests, but still, it was great. <laughs> um, finally, uh, the last count that you do throughout the season is to count the number of chicks uh, in what we call creche, which looks something like this. So it's basically gangs of teenage chicks that get together and run around and cause trouble. Um, and the reason that they form these creches is because penguins go through every year what we call a catastrophic molt, which means that they get a whole new set of feathers all at once um, rather than um, sort of gradually getting new feathers throughout the year like other species of birds do. 
Um, and while they're going through this molting process, they are not actually waterproof. So um, when their chicks reach a certain age, both of the parents will um, sort of leave the nest at once. They go off, um, they eat lots of food, they increase their body weight by about half. So that means that when they're going through the molting process, um, they can just stay on the land and use those fat reserves um, to keep themselves alive. Um, so yeah, they, up until that point, they do shared parenting and one of the parents would be looking after the chicks while the other went off to get food. But once the chicks reach this teenage stage, um, the parents leave them sort of to fend for themselves. So by hanging out in these little gangs with the other penguin chicks, um, that means they can keep each other safe, keep each other warm, keep each other company while their parents are off at sea. Um, so yeah, that's a great survey, going out and counting baby penguins. <laughs> Um, so this is what the long term data looks like at Port Lockroy. Um, I did mention that at most of the sites, the um, Gen 2 penguins are increasing. Unfortunately, that is not the case at Port Lockroy. Um, so we've seen a slight decrease in the average number of nests um, since the survey began in 1997. Uh, um, we've also seen a decrease in the number of eggs and the number of chicks that make it to the crash age as well. So what might be driving that decline? Um, so there's quite a few studies. Um, there's been basically quite a big increase in Antarctic tourism over the last decade or so, um, and especially over the last couple of years. Um, so a lot of scientists are looking into whether there might be any link with increases in tourism um, and whether that's impacting the populations. Um, there are mixed results. Some studies say yes, some studies um, are less conclusive and we're less sure of what the sort of the mode of what's driving that decline might be. So that's something that um, does need um, a little bit more investigation. Um, another thing is climate change is impacting the penguins. So I mentioned that for us, um, or that it was a very significant snowfall year. Um, and while that might sound like something that would be expected in Antarctica, um, the snowfall was um, very heavy and very late into the season. And penguins, uh, gentoo penguins and other um, brush tails, they build their nests out of little pebbles. So they need to be able to get down to the ground to access these pebbles at the nesting sites. Um, and if they can't do that, obviously, if that's covered in a couple of metres of snow. Um, so what the penguins did, uh, they get a little bit desperate and they started to lay their eggs. Well, I mentioned that one laid an egg on the roof, um, but they started to lay their eggs into these sort of divots in the snow rather than a nice little pile of pebbles. Um, and that means that there's no drainage. Basically, the egg is going to freeze. Um, it might um, get sort of drowned in water. It's easy to, for them to accidentally trample on it. And um, they're also more susceptible to predation at that point. Um, so not good news for penguins to be um, laying their eggs in the snow like this. Um, however, Gentoo penguins will um, go on to lay a second clutch of eggs, which is something that, again, I'll talk about a little bit later on. Um, but yeah, it is likely that um, changes in climate are impacting the population. Um, and just to provide a little bit of context there, so our season in 22-23, um, Antarctic season, was a year of really significant snowfall. Um, and that's how the, um, so the results of the survey look there. Um, and that was comparable to something that we saw um, back in 2001 and 2002. So that was a really significant snowfall year um, then as well. And the population completely crashed, had almost a complete breeding failure. Um, so it is something that sort of goes through natural cycles and we would expect to see. Um, however, it has become a little bit more common. Um, the season before I was there um, was a bit of a different one because of COVID. That's why the data is not shown there. Um, but it was, again, a very significant snowfall year. Um, and they did have um, very low numbers of nests, eggs and chicks again there as well. So um, penguins are quite long lived and um, the gentoos will live for sort of 15, 20 years. So having a few of these bad years isn't such a problem. It's just if the climate starts to change and compounds and this becomes more common that it might become a little bit of a problem there. So a little bit more research is needed into what's driving these trends and um, there are people that are looking into it just now. And um, so hopefully we'll get a bit of a better idea on what's causing the decline at Port Lockroy soon. Um, OK, on to my second Antarctic season. Um, so when I was at Port Lockroy, I mentioned it was quite basic conditions. We didn't have any running water, anything like that. Um, and I had some people come over um, the radio when we were down there and say they worked for this organisation called Oceanites. Um, they were stationed on a very nice uh, expedition cruise ship and they were counting penguins. And they asked if we would mind sharing our penguin data with them. And so my thoughts at the time were, wow, that sounds incredible. I would like to be uh, on an expedition cruise ship, traveling around counting penguins. So when I got back from Antarctica, uh, I sent out an email to uh, to this organization, Oceanites, and said, 
I had some experience in counting penguins, asked if they needed any more penguin counters, uh, and luckily um, they, they did. So I got to go back down again for a couple of months um, and work for this uh, really amazing organisation. Um, so Oceanite's mission is to support science-based conservation and climate change awareness using Antarctic penguins as the lens. Um, and this was a really exciting season for me to join Oceanites. It was their 30th season um, surveying penguins in Antarctica. Um, so there were Oceanites was set up um, by this gentleman in the nice orange jacket there. Um, he is called Ron Naveen. Um, he um, was an environmental lawyer from the US uh, and he went down to Antarctica in his late 40s, um, sort of on a tourist trip, um, fell in love with the place, fell in love with the penguins um, and started Oceanites um, and has now got this really incredible data set spanning 30 years. So he's a really good example um, of just how much you can do as one individual if you have the passion, you have the drive um, to turn it into a reality. So Ocean ICs are a US-based NGO and um, we do have collaborators. So we work with um, sort of some universities um, and the British Antarctic Survey and that sort of thing. Um, but we are not exclusively affiliated with any university, government or country. Um, what that means is that Ocean ICs are free to work publicly and transparent, transparently outside of national or political interest to provide data that's used to inform conservation, management and science. So basically what we do is we go out and we just count the penguins and we put the data up online and then anybody that wants to use it and um, can use it in order to make um, sort of conservation management decisions, do any research or that sort of thing. So um, they have a bit of a, a joke tagline that we count penguins so you don't have to. <laughs> Um, and so Oceanites work with ships of opportunity. So that's these um, expedition cruise ships that go down uh, mostly from South America. They travel down to the Antarctic Peninsula um, to survey and to, yeah, bring tourists down to the peninsula. Um, so Ron used to basically rock up to the port um, in South America and just say, do you have any berths? Can anybody take me down to Antarctica and see if you got lucky or not? Um, it's a little bit more organised now. Um, so we, I was very lucky. Um, I got to go down on this very beautiful ship called Viking Octantis. Um, and we had a crew, there was about 16 penguin counters spread out sort of across a few different ships. So we worked with a few other expedition ships as well. Um, and we also worked with the um, the UK Navy ship, the HMS Protector. So they go down, down, down to Antarctica every season. Um, and sort of provide operational support to the bases. So they go to Port Lockroy and they go down to Rothera, a few other British bases um, to provide support. So we had a couple of penguin counters on board with them, traveling around um, wherever basically the Navy would do their operations. Our team would get off and count penguins um, and same with the expedition ships. They um, bring tourists to a site for the day and when the tourists were off doing their um, sort of doing their, their expedition activities, we would get dropped off um, and we would head off to count penguins for the day. So it was yeah, a really, really great experience, very different, got to travel around a lot of different places on the peninsula. So the data that Oceanites collect is um, contributes towards the Antarctic site inventory, um, which now has about two and a half thousand counts um, at about 235 unique sites. Um, and that makes it the most wide ranging penguin monitoring program in the world. Um, so we mostly monitor the penguins down in the peninsula, um, however we do a little bit up in the Falklands and South Georgia as well. Um, and the data that we collect are a mixture of presence absence, so are there penguins there or not, um, site-wide site nest counts, site-wide chick counts, um, and then we use this historical data to conduct spatial and temporal statistical analysis. So we look and see whether um, the penguins are changing in terms of their distribution or their abundance um, in different areas and how that compares across um, the peninsula and a bit further north. Um, the work that we were doing was mostly with the three brush tail penguins again. So we've got the Gen 2 uh, that we had at Port Lockroy, the Chinstrap penguin and the Adelie penguin. Um, and the question that we would most commonly get from people was, how do you count the penguins? How do you make sure that you haven't counted the same penguin twice? Um, and basically we would do that by counting the nests. Um, and what you would do is you go, um, you have this little handheld tally counter, like what they might have at a pub or a club on the weekend. Um, and you would say, okay, I'm gonna count all of the penguins between this rock and this rock. Um, you count, click for every penguin, you click uh, three times, uh, you yeah, click for every penguin. Um, once you've counted all the penguins, you repeat that three times to make sure that your counts are within 5%. And once you're happy with that, you would move on to the um, the next colony. 
the next um, section of the colony. So uh, quite a time consuming process. Um, and so the biggest colony that we counted using this method was about six and a half thousand nests. Um, so we are constrained by the um, sort of the amount of time that the ship is going to spend there once they're finished with their operations with the um, tourists, with the passengers on board. That's time for us to wrap up. So we're quite limited in the amount of time that we have to do our penguin survey. Um, so this was sort of about uh, the most that we could count in, uh, in a day. Um, however, we did have some other tricks up our sleeve. Um, so it's becoming a little bit more common now to use um, uncrewed aerial vehicles, um, also called UAVs, RPAs, or uh, most commonly drones. Um, they've started to use them a little bit more to survey um, penguins um, and some other seabirds down in Antarctica. Um, and there's a few benefits of that. So um, it's really helpful if you have a big colony and um, that you wouldn't be able to go around with your clicker um, and count all of those um, during one short visit. We can just send the drones up and they fly, they take uh, um, hundreds of images in some cases, and then we can stitch those together to get um, really nice renders of what the colony looked like um, so that we can then count from those later on. Um, and I'll just show you a couple of quick examples of how they looked. Um, so one of our um, teams of Oceanites penguin counters actually made it to Port Lockroy. Um, so this is what Port Lockroy looks like from 50 metres up in the air. Um, you can see sort of all the, um, you can see the huts, you can see all the little black dots that are penguins spread out across the island. So they do give you these really incredible high resolution images. Um, we're actually flying from 50 metres up. Um, so yeah, even though you're flying quite high and they have these incredible cameras on them that can give you um, a really good detailed image of how the colony looked. Um, it also helps you look at things like you can see all sort of the squiggly lines going between the colonies. That's the penguin highways. Um, so you can look and see how those evolve and change throughout the season um, and across seasons as well. So it gives you a little bit of extra information um, on the colony, um, sort of the snow levels at any particular time of the year, because you do have these permanent records captured um, by doing your drone flights. Um, and this is just another um, a little 3D render of one of the colonies that we went to. So this was a colony that had chin straps and gentoo penguins. Um, and again, we were just flying the drone um, 50 metres up. It flies over the colony. It takes these really incredible images that you can then use to make a 3D render to see how the site looked. Um, and what we would do once we had those images um, is you can load them into a GIS program um, and then you can zoom in and look and see which of the penguins that you've captured um, in your pictures are nesting and which ones aren't. And we can use that to get nesting counts. So um, in that um, bottom right hand picture there, each of the penguins that had a dot on it, those are ones that we think were nesting compared to ones that um, don't have dots on them. They're ones that we think might just be sort of having a wander around the colony um, or resting. So. Um, they give, yeah, by having these really incredible high resolution images and um, you can look and do these counts afterwards um, of much bigger colonies. So um, this is an example of how one of those looked. Um, so you can see each of the uh, little brown dots, they all represent a penguin nest. So this one had a good few thousand there. Um, we also, uh, the drone that we used was a Mavic Enterprise 3, if there's any drone nerds here. Um, and they have a thermal camera on them as well. So it lets you get these really amazing thermal images. Um, and then when you're doing your penguin counting, if you're not sure, um, maybe there's a penguin that looks particularly like a rock, and um, you can go over to your thermal image and see if it shows up um, bright colored on the thermal images, then it is in fact a penguin. Um, they also let you see some of the other species that are there. So these yellow sort of sluggy bits, um, those are actually elephant seals that were hanging out beside the penguins. Um, and so, yeah, just a little bit on how the penguin populations are doing down there. So we've already been through the genters. We know that they are increasing at about two and a half percent per year. Unfortunately, the story isn't quite so rosy for the Adelis and the chinstraps on the peninsula. So the Adelie populations across the Antarctic Peninsula are declining at about three and a half percent a year um, and the chinstraps just over one percent a year. Um, but this is an average. So this was one of the sites that we visited, which is called Fort Point. Um, you can see above the squiggly line there, that's the Gentoos. Um, below the squiggly line, that's the Chinstraps. Um, and the last time that was counted was only about seven years ago. Um, and our count compared to seven years ago, the Chinstrap penguins had decreased by about 26%. And the Gentoo population had actually increased by about 80% just in seven years. So there are some areas where we're seeing this sort of really rapid transition from um, one species through to another. Um, and there's a few reasons why we think these changes might be taking place. 
Um, so Gen 2 penguins are sometimes referred to as climate change winners, and there's a few reasons for that. So they're expanding their population um, in terms of the size and in terms of the range. Um, they are opportunistic colonizers, so they are more likely to set up a new colony. And um, they're also, as I mentioned, more likely to relay their eggs. So I showed the picture of that one that had laid its egg in that divot in the snow. Um, that egg wouldn't have been successful, but then they will go on then to lay a second clutch of two eggs, um, which means that those ones are more likely to um, survive because they're a bit later on in the season. Um, whereas the other species are less likely to do that. Um, I also briefly mentioned that the Gen 2s have a less specialised diet. Um, so they do eat a lot of krill, um, but they will also eat fish and squid um, in comparison to the other ones that we see are krill obligate species. Yeah, just for sort of all of the opposite reasons why the Gen 2 penguins are doing well, the Adelis and the chin straps, unfortunately, um, are declining. So what have Oceanites achieved uh, this season? We had a really great season and we had a big team of people at Kenton Penguins. Uh, we did over 100 site visits uh, at 54 unique sites. Um, and we also were really lucky to discover a new colony of chinstrap penguins. Um, so this was one of the sites called Astrolab. We were out surveying the penguins in the foreground there. Um, and this is a site where it was really handy that we did have a drone. Um, so Astrolab's made up of all these um, sort of pinnacles that are all spread out and the chinstrap penguins uh, love a bit of mountaineering. They love to go up the side of these pinnacles. So it would make it really challenging. we would have to have a boat and keep getting dropped off um, at each of these um, rocky pinnacles to survey the penguins. So what we were able to do is send the drone up to survey the penguins. And while we were doing that, we noticed this little rock off in the background there. Um, and it looked like it was covered uh, in a suspiciously pink hue, which we thought was indicative of there being some guano and some birds there. Um, so one of the expedition team took us over to have a look and there was a little colony of chinstrap penguins there. And uh, we're not sure if it is a new colony or if it's just one that um, hasn't been surveyed before. But either way, we were really excited to find it um, and find uh, add a new site to our database. Over the last 30 years, um, Oceanites have helped to develop the first Antarctic Travellers Code, which fed into the Antarctic Site Visitor Guidelines. Um, so tourism is quite strictly managed down in Antarctica. Um, most of the sites that the um, tourists get taken to have um, sort of rules around areas where you can go, what species are there, areas that are closed to visitors. Um, and the data that Oceanites has collected has helped feed into that. We conducted strategic long-term monitoring to detect and assess changes in the penguin populations. Um, and then we um, report on those changes every year through the State of Antarctic Penguins report. Um, we also have this website uh, called Map Um So this is a website where all of the counts that we conduct of the penguins over the last 30 years, um, you can go on and um, that's freely accessible. Anybody can go on and have a bit of a look. Um, see um, how many penguins are at each of the colonies. Um, this year, avian flu also made its way down towards um, the Antarctic Peninsula for the first time. Um, so if there were any suspected or confirmed cases of um, avian flu or HPAI, um, they got um, reported to us and we would put it up on our website so that people could keep track of that as well. Uh, we also worked with the Association of Responsible Krill Harvesters. So uh, harvesting krill in Antarctica has sort of taken off um, in the last little while, um, but we worked with them to develop exclusion zones so that they wouldn't um, harvest krill near penguin colonies and um, just so they weren't competing with them for food. Um, and we also have this really cute little uh, ebook called Ron Counts Penguins for Kids. So yeah, uh, Ocean IT's were yeah, a really incredible organisation to work for. A uh, very different experience to being stationary at Port Lockroy at the base. Uh, really great to get to travel around the peninsula. Just quickly, I know I've probably already been talking for a little bit too long, um, but I wanted to just go over some of the um, other Antarctic um, species of birds that we saw down there, because it isn't just all about the penguins. Um, so to start off with, uh, this is a southern giant petrel. So this is one of the uh, Gen 2 penguins or, or penguins generally um, main predator species. Um, so they come in a few different colour morphs. Um, all the way from these dark ones that you see down in the corner um, up to the, um, the snowy white morph on the um, top right hand side there. And um, so about 10% of the southern giant petrels um, have this amazing white morph. Um, and they will predate on um, penguin chicks, um, but the bottom right hand picture that you can see there is actually two um, giant petrels that had worked together um, to get an adult Gen 2 penguin off the beach and into the water where they were able to um, drown it and then eat it. A um, little bit gruesome, but that's just sort of how things go down in Antarctica. Um, and they're joined by a little flock of Wilson storm petrels, which are the world's smallest seabirds. 
and um, they're sometimes called Jesus birds because they look like they're walking around on the water as you can see in the picture there um, and they'll come in and scavenge on the um, the kills that the giant petrels have made there. Uh, the next one is another enemy of the penguin, uh, the south polar skua. Um, so they will come in um, and take penguin eggs. They also take um, quite big penguin chicks. Um, so a lot of people don't really like skuas. Um, when they go down there, they think that there's these big sort of nasty birds that just come in uh, and harass the penguins. However, if you can just about see in this picture here, they do have very cute chicks that they are just trying to get some food for at the end of the day. So had a lot of time for the skuas. They're yeah, very impressive birds to see down there. Uh, another very charismatic one is the snowy sheathbill. Um, so they're the only species of bird found in Antarctica that don't have webbed feet. Um, and so they're these really cheeky little birds that sort of yeah, run around causing a bit of mischief. Um, and they would come and sit on our window panes um, at Port Lockroy and knock on the window in the middle of the night. And it kind of sounded like there was someone knocking on the door. So you would wake up at three in the morning and think, oh my God, I'm on this island in Antarctica. How can there possibly be someone knocking at the door? Uh, and then you would realise that it was just a sheathbill sat knocking on your window. Um, and they also like to have little races running up and down our hut uh, in the middle of the night. So, yeah, they're very charismatic little birds. They also have very cute chicks. Um, and the next one, to get down to the Antarctic Peninsula, you have to cross the Drake Passage, which a lot of people um, might have heard about. It's quite a formidable stretch of sea. However, if you get lucky and the seas aren't too rough, it's really, really incredible for doing some birding. Uh, there's lots of different species of albatross. These were some of the ones that we saw there. So light-mantled sooty, grey-headed, black-browed uh, and snowy albatross. So really lucky um, that a lot of the Drake crossings that I um, was able to do were quite flat um, and got to spend quite a lot of time out on the decks um, looking at these incredible birds. So if you do ever have the opportunity to get down there, um, it really is such a wonderful experience um, for the penguins, but also for all of the other seabirds um, and all the other whales and seals and everything that you see down there as well. Uh, so that's me for now. Uh, thank you very much to Oceanites and to the UK Antarctic Heritage Trust for incredible opportunities of getting to go down to Antarctica. Uh, thank you to Annie for the invite to give this presentation. Thank you to you all for listening. Um, and just to finish off by saying Antarctica has a lot of wonderful things, great wildlife, great scenery. Um, but my favourite thing about it is the people that you meet, everybody down there is so committed. They all really love Antarctica. Um, so this is just a little quote from one of the base leaders of Port Lockroy uh, from the 1960s, saying that it's a cold place with warm people, which I think is quite an apt little summary. Oh, thank you. Oh, oh, that was that fantastic. Was fantastic. Thank you so thank you much. So oh, much. There's, oh, there's a bit of an echo. I don't know why that's there. OK, that sounds much better. That was so interesting. Thank you so much. You've got about a million questions to answer, so you're not <laughs> going to get away too easily. Um, I might just get stuck straight into them so we can get through as many as possible. We had quite a few people who were wondering about tourism and the kind of impacts that that's having. Towards the end of the talk, you did bring up that um, the, was it the tourism uh, agreement? Do you think the, what was that called again? Uh, the visitor guidelines, was it that one? And do you yeah. feel that they're going far enough to reduce the disturbance? Yeah, I think so. The people, people are sort of keeping a close eye on it all the time. It is the number of people that go to Antarctica is increasing, and it does sound kind of shocking, but it is such a big landmass. It's such a big area that, in the grand scheme of things, it isn't actually that many people that are going. Um, and all of the sites have, say, they'll maybe I'd be allowed a maximum of two or three ships visiting them per day. There's a maximum um, number of visitors that can land at any one time and throughout the stretch of a whole day, all that sort of thing. So they do have, um, and they all have periods where you're not allowed to land. So maybe between like 8 p.m. and 6 a.m. or something like that, just to give the wildlife a bit of respite. So it is it's quite strictly managed. Um, I think there is a bit more research needs to be done um, in terms of the impact of marine traffic down there. So all yep. of the ships um, they have these little sort of um, boats that go out and zoom around to bring people onto the land. I think a bit of research is needed done into that and um, the impact of that. But um, yeah, so far it seems like it's okay. <laughs> okay, but we might still be learning things. Yes, lots right. to learn, lots to learn. <laughs> um, that addresses a lot of people's questions. Has there been any research so far on noise levels, so underwater noise particularly on the and the impact that it may have on penguins? Uh, I'm not sure specifically for penguins. I think they have looked into it for 
um, whales. So they now have um, a maximum speed limit that the ships are allowed to go. They're only allowed to go at 10 knots. Um, and that's to sort of decrease the um, the noise and um, when they're stationary a lot of them aren't allowed to use the, the bow thrusters to stay in position that kind of thing to try and reduce the impact of um, any collisions and then uh, reduce the noise that they're making so they are thinking about it but I'm not sure if there's anything being done for the penguins specifically specifically right and yeah. um, Naomi was wondering if you know of any programs to include citizen science on the tour groups for example things like image sharing for locations or species of interest yeah, so that's one of the things is that there is, yeah, it's a bit of a, a double-edged sword that people worry about the tourists going there, but there are a lot of really amazing citizen science um, projects happening. So uh, one is called Happy Whale. Um, so basically, if you get a picture of a humpback whale fluke of the tail, you can submit it to Happy Whale um, and they'll tell you if that whale's been recognised anywhere else or whether it's a new penguin. And sorry, I just saw someone saying go penguins. Whether <laughs> it's a new one that they haven't seen before. <laughs> um, and there's also um, there's Fjord Phyto, they're looking at phytoplankton. Um, there's also penguin um, citizen science projects where people have set up um, remote cameras and lots of different sites. Um, and you can go onto their website and help identify whether you think it's a nesting penguin or a penguin or just a rock or anything. So there are a lot of citizen and science projects going on which is one of the benefits of having more ships going down there. That's really interesting. We also had a lot of people kind of reacting to the declines you showed for the Gentoos in 2001 and 2002 and you came to say that it might have been because it was a significant snowfall year but is it likely that there were other factors at play or is it a really clear relationship between the snowfall there? Um, that so that year, yeah. So their tourism wasn't um, quite at the levels that it was at now, um, and they did they bounced back to like I think the highest that they'd ever been the following year. So I think that was a very um, clear example of just the impact that the snowfall can have because. Yeah, it was really sad they, if they can't build their nests, they can't really like successfully raise their chicks and that sort of thing. So it's it's quite a clear relationship there. And Trish wanted to know how long the molting period lasts when they go through, what was that big molt called? Um, uh, the catastrophic molt. The catastrophic molt. <laughs> this is a great name. Molt. How long does that last? Uh, it's usually around about a month. Um, so, oh. yeah, they, yeah, they just stand around and they look real raggedy. They've got half their feathers are in, half of them have fallen out. They're, yeah, they just stand and look very sad for about a month and yeah they can't eat anything so they start off looking really big and really chunky and by the time they've got almost a whole new set of feathers they're really skinny looking because they're desperate to get back to the sea for some food. <laughs> and are they more susceptible to high snowfall during that period because they're less less waterproof, less maybe insulated? Um, so the chicks more so. So when the chicks are little, they're also not waterproof. Um, so that would be another thing if we start to, as um, Antarctica warms, so the peninsula along with the Arctic is the fastest warming place on Earth. Um, I think it's had about five degrees on average warming in the winter. Um, so what that means is we're getting a bit more precipitation. Um, and so the chicks are really vulnerable to that in their early stages. So if they get wet, then they can get really cold. Um, doesn't always have sort of a good outcome for them. Mm. Uh, mm. Less so the, the adults when they're molting. They're very susceptible to disturbance at that point. So you've got to do a lot to make sure that you leave them in peace. Yeah. Um, could you tell us uh, what kind of... Pina's wondering about how gentoos avoid aerial predators. So things like that southern giant petrel. Do, is it a behavioural response or are they kind of not got, not got a lot of options? <laughs> Yes, yeah, so the uh, I guess so the giant petrels that we saw that had taken the adult penguin, I think that's quite unusual. They would more go for ones that were sick or go for the chicks. Um, one thing that penguins do have going for them is that they have solid bones, where obviously most other birds have hollow bones. So the birds that come in to get them, like the skuas, are quite nervous of them because the penguins also they can sort of slap really hard with their flippers so one slap with a sort of really dense flipper would not be very good news for a skewer if it caught it on the wing or something so they are a little bit hesitant coming in to get them but yeah also a little bit defensive uh, defenseless when you see the, the skewers and stuff coming for the chicks it's yeah oh, okay. <laughs> circle of life <laughs> i might ask some tech specific questions that we've had come in now so orly was wondering if you use infrared cameras on the uavs or if it's just 4k um, so we have we had the thermal cameras. I don't think we is it, that's not the same as infrared, right? We just had no, the no thermal idea. cameras. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, no, we did. We had the um, the thermal cameras, and we mostly just would fly them over um, and take a series of images that we would stitch together. Um, we can also like the the three D image that I had. We can create these sort of ortho rectifications. So they, yeah, the technology that they have is just incredible. They're so so amazing. I used to be one of these people that were quite skeptical of drones because I think everybody gets a bit annoyed at them if you're out hiking or something and you just hear this buzzing going around. But yeah, the stuff that you can do with them down there is just incredible. They're amazing. <laughs> Oh, and do you use LiDAR to get that really high res image that you shared? Uh, no, it's just, just a regular camera. It's just a really, really good camera on them. That's really interesting. And last tech question, um, what GIS software do you use? Uh, just QGIS. So it's free, it's open source, Fish, in case you're wondering. It's um, free, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that's what we use for, for clicking on all the penguins. And um, we do, we have to use sort of specific software to um, stitch all the images together to make the one nice picture of the colony. Um, so we can't do that in QGIS, but yeah, in terms of clicking on penguins, it's a great program for that. Um, now on to some disease questions. So Sue says that Port Lockro was closed recently due to avian flu. Do you know if this has impacted the colony there? Um, no, so that was done out of um, an abundance of caution. Um, so basically to try and reduce the potential to spread avian flu to the colony. And they brought in, uh, there was always rules that you're supposed to stay five metres away from a penguin um, or from any other wildlife, but they got really strict on it this year. And basically because Port Lockhart is such a small area, they said because you can't stay five metres away from the penguins that you can't have any visitors there. So that's why Port Lockhart was closed, just out of an abundance of caution. Uh, they didn't detect any avian flu down there, but yeah, just to keep the penguins safe and keep the team safe. It's great to hear that that thought process was taken. Um, so does that mean that currently there's not a lot of bird flu impact to the gentoos? Um, yes, yeah, so the only places where um, penguins uh, have caught avian flu so far are up um, in South Georgia mostly. There's, so I know there's been it's sort of it's quite a dynamic situation, not quite sure exactly at the moment, um, but there has been um, a lot of avian flu found in South Georgia and I think king penguins have got it. I'm not sure how impacted by it they've been. Um, there have been some Adelie penguins further north as well that have got it, um, but again, they don't seem to be too badly impacted by it. It's more actually the seals, so elephant seals um, have been really badly impacted and some species of albatross as well. That's interesting. Um, and what's do we have a good understanding of the genetic diversity of the gentoos down there? Um, I'm not too sure. I know there's some people that seem to think there are two subspecies uh, genetically. So some people think there's a southern uh, and a northern, um, but I'm not sure where the debate has landed on that. Um, but I guess they, because a lot of people, I guess, think because penguins come back to the same spots to nest over and over again, that there might be some genetic diversity issues. But I don't think so. There's, I mean, there's over 100,000 of them all mixing around down there. So I think they're they're fine. That's good to know. Now, I have a couple of krill questions and krill is obviously a very important thing to be <laughs> discussing. Um, so you did touch on earlier, we had a question from Heidi, whether the declines are associated with krill fisheries. Is there any, and that wouldn't be the case for the gentoos, likely because they're such good generalists um, but for other species is there any evidence of that? Um, yeah I think so I mean the krill harvester I think is still quite new I don't know if they would know if there would be any direct impacts of that so far um, but one of the things is with climate change and um, so basically the there will be the um, the sea ice that will have the phytoplankton underneath it, which will then be what the krill will eat. Um, and I think there's changes to the timing of the sea ice and sort of the extent of the sea ice, which means there's changes to the phytoplankton and the krill populations. So I think one of the theories just now, I don't know if this has been confirmed or not, is that with climate change, there's a change to the timing of when krill is most abundant. And that's not lining up with the time when um, all these new um, penguin chicks really need the krill to be there. Um, so a bit of a missed time in between when they need the food and it not quite being there at the time. Um, that's one of the working theories just now. Mm -hmm. So if, yeah, if the krill's not there, they've got less food, they're not eating the other things like the fish and the squid so much. That's why it's impacting the other species um, and not the gentoos quite as much. So we had a question from Noel come in uh, directly about that. So uh, just in comment on his question, it might be less that there's a decline in the krill population, but more a kind of... Um, it's out of sync. We don't necessarily exactly. have. Yeah. Is it, so what was that, sorry? Yeah. That's kind of it. Yeah. So it's sort of a shift in the 
like where the krill are found and the yeah spatial and temporal dynamics basically where are they and when are they isn't quite where they where they, where they're meant to be and when we need them <laughs> uh, it's um it seems like that's not an isolated event happening right now which i'm sure we're all kind of aware of um <laughs> Now we've got a few more questions. We're on time, but I reckon we could we could sneak in a few more. We might get through, we might not get through everything. Um, Amy, I think this was a tongue-in-cheek question from her. Do you have any volunteer citizen science programs that I think she would like to be applying for? <laughs> um, I'm not sure of any. I know, yeah, I mentioned there's some where you can go online. Um I can't remember the name of the penguin organisation just now. They used to be with Oxford Uni, but they've moved on now, but where you can go and count the penguins online. Uh, but unfortunately, I'm not sure of any that would help you get down to Antarctica specifically. <laughs> I know <laughs> there's nice. um, volunteer organisations here in Australia, but it's, uh, it is arguably less exciting than going to Antarctica. I wouldn't say that myself, but I could hear it. So. Um, yeah, now, I might... Um, oh, no, go ahead. Yes, I was going to say uh, Earthcare. So they, uh, St Kilda, they manage the, the population uh, down at St Kilda Foreshore. So if you do want to get involved with penguins then uh, and you're in Melbourne, then Earthcare is definitely a good way to go about it. <laughs> now, I reckon I will close with one last question and it's a question from me. Um, do you think that there's any actions that conservationists could be taking or should be taking more right now to support species like the chin strap that aren't those um, climate change winners? like the gentoos might be what should we be doing yeah i think just any actions that you can take generally to uh improve your sort of environmental impacts like the it is climate change i mean there's sort of death by a thousand cuts there's lots of things that could be impacting on the penguins but climate change really is a big one so anything that you can do to sort of limit your impact on the environment i think are good steps to take oh. Thank you so much. And I think we're going to wrap it up there. Thank you again for coming and being a part of this. I think I've really enjoyed it. It seems like everyone uh, who persevered with our tech issues has also enjoyed it. I'm going to upload this recording to YouTube. It might not be until after Easter, but if anyone is wondering how they can access this, that's how. But in the meantime, let's all thank Murray and have a really nice night. Yeah, thank, thank you later. so much. Thanks, Annie. Thanks, everyone, for coming.